So let's go ahead and start color, um, let's, let's color the color tools. Let's talk about the color tools that we have in Vision Pro. So we're going to understand the differences between grayscale, representation, and the color. And we need to understand the basics of the color spaces, whether it's RGB or HSI. And then we're going to show, I'm going to show you a couple of the color tools that's going to help you solve some applications. So what, first, we live in a color world, okay? But not every application needs to be color. Can anyone tell me what type of um, applications that you would need to actually have a color camera? For what? Pills. And what are you doing with the pharmaceutical pills? I mean, just detecting which color. You're identifying the color, exactly. Because usually what you're doing is when you have like a color or something, you're either minimizing the color or maximizing it um, so that you can read something. But when you need to identify the color, that's when you have to have a color camera because you're going to have multiple colors there that you just can't deal with with just some lighting and optics or filtering or something. Uh, so that's where our color tools will come in. So the color tools, they're going to take a look at what's going on in your area. And we're going to be able to either extract color from the image so that we can say, hey, this is what part of the image has the color I'm looking for, or to just um, say that the color is a certain color to match it to say, oh, this was the color that I've chosen. Um, now, the color tools that we have, we have a FireWire uh, white balance tool. Now, does anyone know what the white balance tool does? Right, how he kind of said it, it calibrates your color. You're, you're exactly, you're going to do a reference white and everything, and that, that's what you're going to say is your color. So exactly, on most ca cameras, even the Gigi cameras, though the Gigi white balance we don't bring out in Vision Pro, but you can do it on the Gigi utilities there. It's basically where you have your lighting situation, you put a white piece of paper in front of the camera, and you say, this is white. So you white balance it. So in case you have some, like these fluorescents are kind of putting off a, a little yellowish or maybe a pinkish tone to it, that it knows, okay, even though I'm getting that type tone, this is what white is. So anytime that I have any images coming afterwards, it calibrates it saying, I know that this is white. And so, you know, even though I'm seeing a little yellow, I'm not going to pick it up as yellow. I'm going to see it as white. Uh, then as far as tools, we have color match. In composite color match, this is when we train multiple colors and then it's going to come back and tell us what color's in front of the camera. What makes the composite color match is it's not only just the color, it's the distribution. So it's almost looking at texture. That's how I like to try to describe it. The color segmenter and the color extractor both try to remove the color from the image. It, you say what color you're looking for and it basically takes it out of the image and it's going to give you another image that you can then use with another tool like Blob or something to say, hey, what were the colors that I'm looking for? Okay. And with the, uh, the color segmenter and, um, and color, well, with the color extractor, you can use multiple colors. Both add and subtract them, they all become part of the, the model that you're looking for. So what platforms support color? Well, Gigi, it's got a wide variety of color cameras. Um, Firewire, same thing, wide variety. Both of those use bare filters on their cameras. So it means that they are one CCD camera and that they're just using a bare filter over it to decide what the colors are. Usually a bare filter has more green than red and blue when it's picking up the color that's coming into it. Uh, then on the 8504, now notice I have to say 8504, not the 1. I need to have the 4 A to D converters. That's because the one analog color camera, it's the Sony 3 CCD, actually acquires the image on three separate CCDs. One image, one of the CCDs for red, one's for green, one's for blue. So it's doing a simultaneous acquisition all at the same time. So that's why I have to have the 8504 because I need to have three channels that I can come in at the same time on to get that image. And then finally, the 8600 with camera link. That supports color as well, both um, area scan and line scan cameras, though that will be your most expensive. But that usually gives you the most pixels and gives you the fastest. <coughs> it, instead of having grayscale band there, it's a color band. I'm not sure if it does a uh, bare filter on top of it, but they do have color line scan. 
it is picking up. I mean, it, what it might be doing is kind of like a line scan that we create for inside that it's actually a couple of pixels coming down, even though we um, average it to be one pixel. So it might be doing some type of minor bear filter going down there to pick up what that color would be. So we have your color, okay? You have RGB and HSI, those are the two ways that you can represent the color. Now, for a single color, whether it's RGB or HSI, it's just a mathematical equation away from itself, okay? But I liked how someone described HSI to me once. They said that's closer to how humans look at something. Uh, when, when I look, like, let's take a look at that, uh, the CD over there on the wall with the Vision Pro. If I look at it, that's kind of yellowish, okay? Now, if someone were to ask me, well, what is that in RGB? I'd be like, there's no red, green, or blue in it. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, of course I know there's the combinations of that. That's how the TVs work and everything. So I can get yellow out of it. But um, intuitively to my mind, I'm like, there's no red or green or blue in this. I'm not sure how much of each. But if I think HSI, your H is where on your wheel is it? What is the hue? So I would say, OK, my hue is probably right around my yellow zone. Okay. And then the saturation is how rich is that color? Huh, not bad. I'd probably put it like maybe, you know, a little bit less than full, you know, with saturation. And then your intensity is kind of how dark, you know, or basically how not dark it is. So that one's got some black in it. So I'd probably say it's about mid-intensity. So you notice that it's kind of a continuous scale with HSI. But once again, it's whether I represent something in RGB or HSI, they're the same thing. So if I was trying to read red in RGB, it'd be all red, no green, no blue. Green would be no red, all green, no blue. And then blue would be no red or green and all blue. But notice that over on the HSI, the only thing that changed here was the hue. We kept full saturation and we gave it a moderate intensity. So all that we've changed was just the hue on there. So you might say, well, why would I use one over the other? Any time that you do a color application, I've got to tell you right now, color becomes an art. It's not just something that you throw it in and everything and it works perfectly, you know, like Pat Max. You know, we're kind of spoiled to that. Train it and everything and off we go and we don't care about it. It doesn't care about lighting and everything. Oh, yeah, color cares about lighting. You definitely have to control your lighting. You have to control shading. You have to rec um, uh, check reflections. Like if someone's walking by with a bright shirt, is that going to reflect off of some light and cast down on your part? So you have to take all that into consideration. Now, we had a customer who was doing bologna, ham, and turkey. They were trying to decide the difference between them. Which two is going to be the most confusing? Bologna and ham, because they're both pink. Exactly. We can probably decide which one's the turkey with no problem, but the bologna and ham, eh, it's going to be kind of close in color. So what they found is that when they did RGB, they were almost the same. Okay, almost the same. Didn't see the difference between them. But then when they switched to HSI, they saw that one of the values, and I want to say it was saturation, one of the values changed repeatedly enough and large enough dis difference between them that they could reliably say, yes, that is ham and that is bologna. So what I'm trying to say is the moral of the story is whenever you're doing color, try both. If you're having results coming back that you're kind of, you know, is that getting too close to what the other color is? Could I get confusion here? Try it with the other spectrum. See if that's going to give you better results when it starts trying to divide them. Because even though they're the same color that they're representing them, they're representing them in a different way. So that's where it might help you. Make sense? Kind of neat? A uh, color match tool. So the color match tool is kind of our basic tool. What we're going to do is we're going to go in there and we're going to train the colors. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put the, um, a color underneath the camera or a region underneath the camera, and it's going to tell us which of the colors does it most match. So it's going to compare with what it has inside its library. So when you go to train the library, it's going to ask you, do you want to train by a point or by a region? Now, why, why might you use a region to do some averaging, exactly, especially if you're going to have maybe a little glare in that area or a little bit of shading in that area? You're taking that whole thing into consideration. If you give it a specific number, then that's exactly what it's looking for, which might be good if you're like inspecting paint and you don't have any lighting or reflection things that you're just looking at the color of the paint. That might be perfect. But if you're doing something like a curved surface or a reflective surface, you might want to do um, a region just to give yourself a little bit of leniency there. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to record your multiple colors, and then what it does is it goes through your library there and it tries to match up against it. Whoever has the highest score is going to be the one that it most closely matches, and it says that's the one that it is. Okay. So in this case, you know, we have, it doesn't really come through very well on this slide. Um, we have like different jello flavorings there. And you'll notice that, you know, yellow, orange, and green, we don't have a problem with. But when we start getting to like grape and we start getting to black cherry, those colors are pretty close to each other. So that's why we have to be very particular when we're training them. And this might be one of the situations you can try HSI versus RGB to see which one's going to give you the better results. Because even to a human eye, those look pretty close to each other. Then we also have composite match. And so where the simple match, just your color match tool is looking for your average RGB or HSI value, composite is actually looking for distribution. I like to describe it as almost looking for texture. Okay? So let's say that you're looking at seat covers. Okay? And the seat covers are all tan. But on one seat, you can't, let's see if I can see it better on the next slide. So on one seat, it's just plain tan. The next seat is going to be like maybe a little bit of blue in it. The next seat is going to be more of a textured tan. And this one over here is going to be like little red checks in it. When I start going over here, now I'm weaving this, the seats. So just a basic weave, a hound's tooth weave, and I have no idea what type of weave they want to call this. But it's just a different type look. So what it's looking for now is it's looking for distribution. It's looking for that texture. And that's how it's telling them apart. Because if I were to just do a color match tool in here, they would all be about the same color because they're all coming up that tan. But instead, I'm able to do the composite match by saying, oh, I want to bring in a little bit more detail there. I want to look at that light to dark transition and how it's relating to each other and pick it out from there. So that's the color match tool. Pretty straightforward. Then we have the color extractor tool. Now the color extractor tool ended up kind of taking over for the color segmenter did. Uh, they both remove your color from your image. That's what they're looking for, that you're going to state which color that you, you have. Uh, the color extractor, you can both add and subtract colors, while the color segmenter, it was only you decided in the um, RGB histograms what color you're caring about. So it's, there's no subtraction, only an adding. So in this case, I might only train on just orange candies. So all that it's going to pull out of there is that I have orange candies. It's not going to show me any of the other candies. It's just going to show me the orange ones that are sitting there. So when you define it, okay, it's going to end up being a group. And these, the colors within the group can be added and subtracted for each other. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to um, actually add what your generic color is. And then what you want to see is what happens if I'm looking for that color, does it come up elsewhere? Well, what do I mean by that? When I go to train my orange, the first time I train it, I might train it on this candy. And when I look for it, notice it picks up this candy and this candy, but it's also picking up a little bit of the red. That's because there is some of the orange color does fall into red. But then what I can do is for my um, red, I can go in there and I can subtract that color. So now it knows if I just find that color, that's not part of what I'm looking for. Okay, Just remove that color from it, only give me the orange colors. So now I'm only picking up the orange candies. Now whenever you're setting up your colors, always set your, me uh, your minimum pixel count to 1. By default, it's set to 10. And what it's saying is how many pixels need to be of that color for me to consider part of it. So by doing one, I'm trying to pick up every single pixel that falls into that. Now, there might be a time you don't. Maybe you do only want like the bigger colors and little small things you don't want to take into consideration. But otherwise, I would move it to one so that you're picking up every single color that's in there. Now, when you do your original color, you want to set your dilate to one. The reason you want to set, you set your dilate to one is that right around the edges of your color, it's going to be rough. And what you're saying is, I'm allowing a little smoothing around there. Go ahead and take in some of the pixels right around the edges of my color to give me a better result coming back from it, not just a very you know, rough, hard, scratchy type look to it. Okay? So that's only when you do your original color. Whenever you do your subtraction of colors, do not put a dilate on it. Let it just remove the color itself. 
So Vision Pro can handle additional color information by using color cameras. Remember, we're doing that when we're trying to identify color. Color can be represented both in RGB and the HSI color spaces. Remember, your color match tool is where you're going to train a color library, and you're just deciding what color matches the best from your color library. So you're just identifying which color it is. While the, um, the composite match also throws in texture. You can also see some distribution with that. And the color extractor tool is how you're going to be able to pull the color out of the image. You know, not just identifying which one's there, but only taking the orange out of it only seeing that particular color. It also will generate a separate image, and that separate image can then be used by another tool to do some further analysis. Like maybe in Blob, you want to see, well, maybe how round is it? You know, what's its perimeter? What's, you know, find out information about its geometric shape. So let's try this. No, we are not doing it with our color camera. So what I'm going to do is I've already changed, I've already saved my application, okay? I am going to create a new application right now. And my first application in here, so if I open this up, this is going to be my first job. I'm going to call this job, just so I don't confuse it, I'm going to call it color Come on. match, okay? So my image source for my color match, I'm actually going to pull an image from the library that's automatically loaded with the software. So I'm going to say choose file. I'm going to go to my C directory. I'm going to go down to program files, Cognix, Vision Pro. And then I want to look underneath my images directory. And the one that I want to grab for this one is going to be called Smiley. So here's a little smiley. It's a little bitmap. It's a little color bitmap image I have. And I'm going to say open. So if I say live for it, this is what I see. It just keeps showing me the same image over and over again. OK? That's my image, smiley. So let me go ahead and close this. If I acquire this once, I see my smiley faces sitting over in my corner. Now the tool that I'm going to add with this is going to be the color match tool. So I'm going to open up my toolbox. I'm going to look underneath color, and I'm going to grab just the cog color match tool. So of course, what's the first thing I need to do when I add a tool? Yep, I got to connect the input image to my image source. Okay, run it once so it has it. So of course, it's going to fail. Why is it going to fail? I haven't trained anything, exactly. There's nothing to be compared against. So I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to start trying to train. So inside the first tab right here, I'm going to go ahead and say add a new color. I'm going to select a region instead of a point. Okay. And my region, I'm going to make it be a circle, because that's going to match what my colors are right now. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Let me dig in just a bit. And I'm just going to put it to be right in the middle of my happy face. Now, why don't I pick up the excess on the outside? Yeah, it's going to throw off my color a bit. Well, why do I pick up the happy face? I mean, the, the actual black in there, I'm picking up some of that. Well, I'm going to pick that up on my region when I'm looking for it, too. If I wanted to, I could make it very small and that be the only thing I look for. But then when I go look for it inside my um, field of view, I want to make sure it's that small as well. So since it'll probably be easier for me to actually just look at the happy face, but not take in the extra because the colors underneath the happy faces do change, I'm just going to take just the happy face, make sure I'm not picking up any of the outside black. So it's asking me, what do you want the name to be? I'm going to have the name be yellow. Okay. I can choose which space I want it to be in, RGB or HSI. I can choose at this point. After I choose it, I believe it stays that way, but I can choose it. So let me go ahead and say accept, and you'll notice that I automatically create a color that's called yellow. Let me go ahead and create another one. Select a region again, and this time I'm going to go ahead and move it over, and I'm going to call this pink using really original names, aren't I? 
Where was it when it opened up all of a sudden? It's the only one there. The other, other region's not showing, right? So the little region is. This is where it gets a little bit tough, but yes, the other, um, there, we're, this is one of the tools that we're, if there's not a train image thing, that they're both using the input image, but I haven't gone to region yet. So right now the region is picking up the fill, full field of view. I'm only training my colors right now. So that's why it was the same size. Kind of yeah, because it was the one that I had just uh, saved before, so it brought it right on over. Whoa. Yep. So let me go ahead and accept it, and that trains my pink. Let me add another one, select a region, and this time I'm just going to move it on over. And guess what this one's name is going to be? Green, Mr. Green. Killed someone in the library with a candlestick. You say accept for that one. And then the last one, select a region again, and I'm going to pull it on over to the blue guy. I'm going to call it blue. Say accept. Okay, so I have all my colors trained here. Beautiful. If I don't want to use any of them, I could physically go in there and disable them if I want. Um, otherwise, they're all by default come in enabled. Now I go to my region. Okay, right now it's saying it's using the entire image. So if I go to run it, notice that my result ends up being kind of a puke brown, uh, much like when you took all your paints when you were younger and mixed them all together. Yeah, that's what you get. Because it's taking the full field of view in. All the colors are getting averaged together. So what I need to do is I need to denote that it's a particular area that I'm looking for. So in order to do that, I go back to my region. Instead of saying use the entire image, I'm going to say cog circle, and it's going to give me a circle. Now this is where it might get confusing. The same image that I was setting up my training of them on is the same image that I'm going to set up my in, where my region of interest is. So don't get confused there. You can only get to the training region when you're actively training a color. Otherwise, it's not there, so you shouldn't be able to confuse the two. So I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move it up to one of the other yellows that I didn't train. And now if I run it, notice it says that with a score of point, um, 0.942, it found that this was yellow. If I move this region again, maybe down to this yellow, run it again, and sure enough, finds that as yellow. Let's move it over to this guy here. If I run it, now it says blue is our highest one. Move it over here, and now it's saying green is our highest. And finally, let's pull a, maybe a pink from the top and now it says pink's your highest. So just by moving the region around, it's going to identify what color is being placed in front of the um, camera for the region of interest. Kind of neat, kind of cool. Not a lot of excitement with your, uh, the actual run parameters. That just helps you dial in whether you want uh, distance in RGB space or HSI space. Somehow you have to manage the region with those things, and dynamics for multiple. Yeah. Yep. So that, I think that would be much like what we were saying before when we were looking at them. Mm -hmm. So if I close this and bring this open, um, I add my terminals. There's my region right there. So I can bring in a type of region, in this case, of my cog circle, and bring in what the center should be. And all these can be inputs. We'll talk more about regions when we talk about the programming on Friday. It's the very last section that we do, but they're pretty straightforward to do. So if I were to bring at these out as um, inputs, that would allow for me to have another tool come in and feed what those should be. Everyone's okay on the match? You guys ready for the extractor? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a new job for it. So not a new application, just a new job. So I'm just going to bring forth so it has another job in here. And I'm going to call this color extractor. That what? Uh, it's one that looks kind of like a clipboard with a blue and a red little check type thing on it. That's going to allow for me to do an add cog job. If I go underneath here, I would have to. I guess they really don't have it so that you can say a new one from there. It's got to be a. 
window cap right there. So hold it over and wait. Yeah. yeah. You definitely have to do it from a, a button here. Okay, so the image source for this one is still going to be your program files, Cognix Vision Pro images. But the one that I want to see is it's called Color Flowers. Okay. If I do my live image, it's just going to be a bouquet of roses and other flowers. Okay. What I want to do with this is I want to pull out just the roses because maybe someone's trying to identify, hey, do we have enough roses showing on here? I mean, yes, I could give it six roses, but what I want to do is I want to make sure that it's seen and that maybe a certain amount of it is there. Okay. So let me go ahead and acquire one so I get the image in memory. Okay. And then what I want to do is I want to bring forth the color extractor tool. So I'm going to open up the toolbox, go down to color, color extractor, drag and drop that into my job. So of course we're going to do the same thing that we've done before. We've got to attach the input image to the image source output image and run it once. And we know it's going to fail because we haven't made any active colors yet. There's no one that's extracting. So now let's go into the tool itself. So the first thing I need to do is I need to add my own. Um, I'm using group zero right now. I want to add a color to group zero. Okay. So the color that I'm going to add to it is I might call this rose. Okay. The shape that I'm going to use is I'm actually going to use, let's try an ellipse. Okay. So I'm going to an ellipse can be made into a circle, not a big deal, but I'm going to put it around my rose. Okay. I don't want to pick up a lot of the green on the outside or anything, I'm just trying to keep it right on the rose itself. So I'm going to go ahead and say accept, and it brings my rose into it. Right now the action is add. And if I were to just run it as is, what I would see is here's my overall grayscale image. This is where it shows me my roses are. And if I take a look at the overall color image, it shows me these are the areas that it sees roses on my image. Okay. Now right now my minimum pixel count is 10, so it means that I have to have at least 10 pixels touching each other of that color for me to consider that my rose. So I'm going to actually lower this down to 1 and watch what happens when I run it again. Picks up a little bit more in here, especially of the one I've trained but it's picking up a bit more of the rose. Now do you see how it's kind of blocky towards the edges? You know, I'm definitely losing stuff. If I move my dilation up to one and run it again, watch how it helps to smooth it out a little bit, okay? Picks up more of the colors, but it also is now picking up some of this color, okay? Which happens to be the little sunflower. Some of the center of the sunflower is same color as a rose. So now what I need to do is I'm going to go in, I'm going to have another color. I'm going to call this orange flower because I used to call it sunflower but I have no idea what type flower it is. Orange flower one. Okay. A daisy? I'm not even sure it's a daisy but okay. That what? The orange? Is a Gerber daisy? Okay. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of put it around the opening, you know, right around where my, my flower is here, you know, the center of it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say accept. But this time, instead of add, I'm going to subtract it. Okay. So if I run it how it is right now and just run here, notice that it, it only took out a little bit of it. But that's because my minimal pixel count I left up at 10. So it's only going to take out as long as I have 10 pixels touching each other that's going to take that out. So what I want to do is I want to lower this to 1 and try it again. So if I do that, notice it takes out the center of my flower there. I need to do it kind of one more time over here, kind of clean this one up as well. So let me go ahead, add another color. And this time uh, we'll just say Gerber Daisy then. <laughs> So if that's what it is, OK, 
Okay, go back to my input image so I can re reset this. And this time I'm going to go ahead, spin it just a little bit. Now I'm trying not to take any of the green behind there, not that it really matters, but I just want to try to take what that color is. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and accept that. Once again, move this down to 1 and make sure that I subtract it, not add it. So now if I take a look at my color image and I run it, notice it takes that out. Now I could try to go down and clean this up a little bit, but that's pretty good. Pretty good with just showing what my roses of what they look like. And my grayscale looks a little bit more, but that's because it's, there's some of the strayer colors around the side here. I could try to get a little bit more specific, but so far so good. And so that's my one group. That's the one that just does daisies. Okay. Now I could go in and I could create another group. I'm sorry, roses. Not daisies, roses. So my group right here, I could say rows only. Mm. So that takes care of my roses only group. Maybe I might want to do another one that might be daisy only. Okay. And I'll let you guys go ahead and put that um, together. But it just allows for you to have different sets of colors that are added and subtracted. So in your daisy only set, if you go back to there, my daisy only, I can start adding just the daisy color and remove if it picks up only the, the rose color. So we have to add a new group first. Well, because a group is actually a collection of colors. Right. So, I mean, mechanically, we go back to groups. Yes, we have to add the group so that it knows that it has it in this pull-down list. Gotcha. Otherwise, whenever you're doing here, you're just adding colors to the group. And then, basically, as you start, you know, running these and you have multiple groups, it's going to let us know how many pixels of each it had found it to be. No collision if names are the same in different groups as in other groups? So no, I don't think so because the colors are going to be maintained just within the group. Uh, but they are going to have problems if groups are the same name. Right. right. But so the. have orange flower, one orange flower, two orange flower. Yes, I believe, yes. Yes. Now, what you're going to get out is notice that it automatically gives me a grayscale image. So now that image could then be fed into, like, what type tool? A blob tool, yep, and I could do a blob tool to take a look at what the amorphous shapes are. So let me go ahead and try that. So if I take this out, create a blob tool, the input image will be the grayscale coming back from it. Run it once, and I'm looking for a light on black background. So what I end up getting back is just this, and it's telling me that I have found um, 42 blobs. Not bad. I could filter it to make sure that I'm only picking up blobs and holes. So maybe my, uh, my run time, I want to filter to exclude some of the small stuff. So I'm, I'm going to exclude anything that's maybe like 25 pixels or below. Okay. And then I might also want to exclude anything that is holes. So if I run this again, notice it takes out some of the extra blobs I have around here and this is the only colors I have left. So I went from 42 down to 19 